Erev Tov, everybody. Welcome to a special edition of our Monday night class. Tonight's shiur is dedicated in memory of my dear father-in-law, Abraham Shalomu Ederi Zichrono Libracha, whose tonight is Nahala. May the words of Torah that we learn tonight and spread tonight be Leilu Nishmato Bezrat Hashem. Tonight we are swaying slightly away from our typical Monday night topic. Normally on Monday nights we study works of Musar, such as Mishle or Perkei Avot. However, Shulchan Aruch is very clear. He begins Hilchot Pesach by saying 30 days prior to the start of the holiday, you should begin engaging in the laws of the holiday, given that they are numerous and complex. And therefore... For the sake of our uh, increased knowledge and our drive to broaden our, our knowledge in Halakha and Hilchot Pesach, I've decided that for the next few weeks on Monday night, we are going to study Hilchot Pesach in a more uh, complex, deeper, and understanding the reasons behind certain things that what we do. I'm not going to focus much on the laws of the seder. I actually have a recording of that in a previous shiur I gave about a year ago. Um, and I'll post that later, or you can search that on the podcast website. However, I want to focus on a few ideas that are very relevant indeed about hametz mixtures. We're going to start off with ta'arovet hametz, the mixtures of hametz, and whether or not they can render food, permissive, permissible food forbidden. So, in general, when a forbidden food becomes mixed with permitted food, there is this concept called batel beshishim. Batel beshishim means that the food is rendered insignificant. The non-kosher food is rendered insignificant if, if it constitutes less than one sixtieth of the mixture. If it constitutes less than one sixtieth of the mixture, then it's insignificant. It's like it doesn't exist. In such small quantities, it doesn't contribute flavor. On the level of the Torah, according to the Torah, hametz is also batel beshishim. It also would be nullified completely if it is less than one sixtieth. The Chachamim, however, were stringent and ordained that even a drop of hametz render a permitted food forbidden when it's mixed with it. Even if the quantity of the permitted food is a thousand times the hametz, ten thousand times the hametz, the entire mixture becomes forbidden. Now the rabbis added this stringency because the Torah itself is more stringent about hametz than other forbidden foods. This is true because of two things. One, generally, if a person consumes forbidden food from the Torah, some person eats pig, for example, the punishment is malkut, lashes. But a person who eats hametz incurs a more severe punishment of karet, extirpation, a much more severe form of punishment. That's one reason why the Chachamim were strict with regards to hametz. Number two, Whereas all other forbidden foods may be kept in a person's home, I can have non-kosher food sitting in my basement closet. It's mutar. Hametz can neither be seen or found in our homes throughout the holiday. As we know, there's a separate commandment of bali ra'e and bali matzeh that you cannot own or see hametz during the holiday. So therefore the Chachamim continued this direction by establishing a fence, a safeguard, that even if a drop of hametz falls into food, it is forbidden to consume it or derive benefit from it. Another reason for the stringency is that all other forbidden foods are prohibited throughout the year. And as a result, we are accustomed to distance ourselves from it. I know I'm not going to go and eat bacon. I'm just used to it by now. But we all eat hametz all year long. Bread, bagels, cookies, crackers, hamintashin, it's, uh, uh, hamin. There's a lot of things 
that we eat during the year that is that is hametz, and we are liable to forget that it is forbidden on Pesach. So therefore, the Chachamim are more stringent about hametz, so that everybody remembers to be careful about it. This law that we just mentioned, that even a drop of hametz renders a mixture forbidden, goes into effect at the start of the holiday, at the start of Pesach. A lot of people are unaware, however, that before Pesach, hametz is batel b'shishim like all other forbidden foods, meaning if there is more than 60 times of permitted food, then technically it's okay. We're going to talk more about it. Now, although the prohibition against eating chametz and the mitzvah to dispose of the chametz goes into effect on the midday of the 14th, we're going to get we're going to burn our chametz by, by midday on, the, on Erev Pesach, the law that chametz is not batel b'shishim the meaning the law that a drop of chametz can render a whole food forbidden does not take effect until Pesach starts. That's because when a person consumes chametz, he incurs karet when? Only when Pesach has begun. When, when the prohibitions of Bal Yira'e and Bal Yimatse take, uh, take uh, effect. Now, can a mixture containing a drop of hametz be salvaged. Can I do something with this? So we've we've just learned that the laws of hametz are uniquely strict, that even a minuscule amount of hametz mixed with permitted foods renders the entire mixture forbidden for consumption or benefit. Um, however, most post scheme hold that if the hametz is less than 1 60th of the mixture, one can salvage its monetary value. How? By selling it to a goy. You're allowed to sell it to a goy. For example, if a kilo, if a kilo of hametz falls into a metric ton of permitted food, clearly much more than 60 times, then it's permitted to sell the food, the mixer to a goy, as long as you remove one kilo of the mixture to avoid benefiting from the added chametz. Because when the rabbis forbade benefiting from such mixtures, the intention or their intention was to forbid benefiting from the chametz as well. So if I dispose uh, the quantity of the mixture equaling the amount of chametz, if I knew that a kilo of chametz fell into that ton and I remove a kilo of the mixture, then I don't benefit from the chametz anymore. I can sell the mixture to a Gentile. If a single wheat grain of chametz fell into a large pot, a large vat of cooked food, it all becomes forbidden to eat and benefit from as long as it remains in the Jew's hands. But you can sell it to a Gentile. It's not necessary to dispose any of the mixture because the wheat did not cause the price of that to rise, that one thing. Now that is the opinion of the Shulchan Aruch, as we're going to see, we're, there's going to be a lot of differences here between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim being a lot more strict. The Rama, the Ashkenazi, who represents the Ashkenazi Jews, rules very stringently in accordance with a few Rishonim, who maintain that it's forbidden to derive any benefit from the mixture, and because it's forbidden to derive any benefit from the mixture, you can't sell it to a goy. Even if you remove a little bit of hametz, once it's asur, it's asur. Done. Take it, throw it in the garbage. The entire mixture needs to be destroyed. And this is how the Ashkenazim practice. Now, there is a Mishnah Brua that writes that if the result of such will, will uh, result in a very big loss, a monetary loss, then there are those Ashkenazi poskim that say you could rely upon the opinions who permit selling the mixture uh, uh, to to a goy. The big question that you know that often uh, is is uh, discussed and has so many implications amongst uh, those trying to understand the whole concept of kosher for Passover is whether or not hametz that was nullified prior to Pesach can regain its status. 
many, the Rishonim disagree to this, and I want to explain it well so everybody here understands. And again, we did mention, we did talk about this in a previous shiur last year, but it's good to, to say it again. If I had chametz that was nullified, batel beshishim, like we said before Pesach, before Pesach, if it's more than one, if it's, if there's 60 times good food more than the chametz, then it's batel, as if the chametz doesn't exist. The question is, does this chametz, does it reawaken when Pesach arrives? The terminology that the Gemara uses is hozer v'neor. It comes back and reawakens. Its nullification is reversed when Pesach arrives. Or do we say, no, once it was nullified before Pesach, once there was more than 60 times the non chametz food that that nullified the chametz before Pesach, that's it, it's done, it's nullified, and therefore I don't care about now this food on um, on Pesach, I can eat it. Now, if I say that the chametz reawakens, if I say that the chametz is now alive again, then the entire mixture is rendered forbidden. Even though it was batel before Pesach, because it reawakened now, and it reawakened on Pesach. For example, a crumb of hametz that falls into a large dish of cooked meat before Pesach. A little crumb, a bread crumb, falls into your, your, your lamb stew. Batel. There's so much lamb over there. One crumb of hametz, it's nothing. One bread crumb. Batel. Much more, way more than 60 times that crumb. Now, can I eat this lamb stew on Pesach? I cooked before Pesach, it was nullified. But now, can I eat this lamb stew on Pesach? Some poskim rule that if the chametz was batel beshishim before Pesach, if the chametz was nullified before Pesach, it's considered completely eradicated. It cannot be chozer v'neor, it will not reawaken. And therefore, the entire mixture, this lamb stew, is now permitted for consumption. Other poskim say no. The annulment that takes place before Pesach is not effective. And once Pesach begins, the chametz reawakens, and the entire mixture is rendered forbidden. That's actually the opinion of the Rambam, who was a Sephardic posek, but as we're going to see, we don't hold like him. This question, by the way, has tremendous implications for the status of matzot. Sometimes... Sometimes water drips on uh, a mound of wheat grains, causing a few of the grains to leaven. Now it's very difficult to find these grains and remove them from the pile. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of wheat grains. And now some water fell on it and, and made those grains hametz. But it's clear, there's no doubt, that the kosher wheat grains, the ones that were not affected by the water, outnumbered the leavened wheat grains by more than 60 to 1. That is for sure. So according to the opinion that the chametz is chozer v'neor, that the chametz reawakens on Pesach, if all that wheat is ground together and the matzot are baked from that flour, forbidden to eat those matzot on Pesach. Because that drop of chametz renders all the matzot forbidden, even though it was nullified before Pesach. And therefore, according to, to those that hold Choser Veneor, that Hamet reawakens, you have to make sure that there's not one single leavened grain in that wheat from which the matzah is made. But according to the opinion that the Hametz that is nullified before Pesach is not Choser Veneor, then the matzot are kosher for Pesach. Even though there's actually a little bit of Hametz in there, there's no need to check the wheat kernels one by one. Unnecessary. They were already batel beshishim prior to Pesach. So now, how does this work in practice? So the Shuchan Aruch rules that when cham, when the chametz is batel beshishim, when the chametz is nullified before Pesach, one in sixty, it's not chozer v'neor. It does not reawaken when Pesach begins, and therefore it's permissible to eat such a mixture on Pesach. And this is because, according to the Torah, like we said at the beginning of the class, chametz is nullified in 60, even during Pesach. This is what we hold of. 
even during Pesach. It's only the Chachamim that made the stringency. So Shuchana Ruch says that it's fine. It's not Choser ben Neor. It was only the sages that added the stringency of rendering the mixture forbidden because of a drop. So, what does this mean? As a result, the whole dispute of Choser ben Neor is rabbinic. It's rabbinically, uh, it originates from a rabbinic uh, discussion. Whenever you're in doubt about a rabbinic dispute, safek de rabbanan lekula. The halakha follows the lenient opinion. And this is the, uh, this is, and therefore Shulchan Aruch rules that this mixture is allowed because it's not Choser Veneor. And this has been adopted by most Sephardic Jews. The Ramah rules in accordance with the Trumat Adeshen, another Rishonim, that writes that if the Chametz was nullified before Pesach, the Ramah being the the great sage who represents the Ashkenazi Jews, he writes that even though that the, the Chametz was nullified prior to Pesach, he goes, it depends. If it was a fluid mixture, Lach, then the Halakha follows the lenient opinion, and the Chametz is not Choser Veneor. It doesn't reawaken. If the mixture was fluid, if it was solid, if it was Yavesh, then the law follows a stringent opinion, and it is Choser Veneor. For example, if a drop of beer, which is Chametz, falls into another beverage, and it blends with that liquid to the point that it ceases to exist independently. You can't tell that there's a beer that there's beer there. So now that it's been nullified before Pesach, it's not Choser Veneor because it's a liquid. It doesn't render the mixture forbidden, and you can drink that mixture on Pesach. But if a crumb of Chametz falls into a, into solid food, because of the fact that that crumb of Chametz continues to exist independently and does not blend with the mixture, the Ramah says it has a degree of significance. And therefore, when Pesach arrives, it is Choser Veneor. It reawakens and renders the entire mixture forbidden. And this is the approach that has been adopted by the Ashkenazi Jews and some Sephardic Jews. Who are the Sephardic Jews? It's quoted down by the Kafa Chaim that many Sephardim have the custom to be stringent about Choser Veneor, like the Ashkenazim. Uh, the Chida brings it down in Birke Yosef as well. They, they were, it seems that these authorities were, were stringent with regards to liquid mixtures. Um, however, Chamovadia Yosef in Yabia Omer, Rav Shalom Esas, in many of his teshuvot representing the Moroccan Jews, were very clear that in their lands at least, uh, for sure in Morocco, they did not go against Maran Shuchan Aruch when it came to Pesach, and therefore they hold that Chametz does not reawaken, and such a mixture would be permitted uh, permitted to eat. This, Rabotai, has so much, um, again, ramifications on the food that we buy in the stores. Forget about the kitniot, which maybe we'll talk about uh, a different week, maybe next week or the week after. But sometimes you always hear about, oh wait, but this food it has a trace of chametz, tra- but a trace of chametz for Sfaradim is nothing. From the fact that it was batel from it was batel b'shishim before Pesach, obviously you can't do it on Pesach. You can't take wheat kernels, one wheat kernel, and put it into your lamb stew on Pesach. We know you're not allowed to do that. But if something ha- if something was nullified, if there was chametz in a mixture in a product in the store that was nullified, then according to the Sfaradim, it's permitted to eat. This is a gigantic difference between the Sfaradim and the Ashkenazim when it comes to Pesach. Flour, because of its fineness, is considered a fluid mixture, and this is because the distinction between fluid and solid depends principally on whether or not the forbidden uh, foods are able to blend in with the permitted food. Uh, In a fluid mixture, the forbidden food easily blends in. Not so much with a solid mixture, it remains independent. as a result, there is no need to check the wheat grains before they are ground and baked into matzot because after the wheat is ground into flour, the flour produced from the leavened grains are nullified and blend completely with the rest of the flour. And when Pesach arrives, it's not going to reawaken. 
It won't make the, 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 the mixture forbidden. Um, based on this principle, many poskim say that it's best to bake matzot before Pesach so that if some of the flour or dough becomes chametz during the kneading process, it will blend with the rest of the dough. The dough actually has a status of, 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 of fluid, even according to those that are, are strict, because it's all blended. You can't notice it. And therefore, you don't have the, um, the idea or the concept of Choser Veneor won't take, in, uh, take uh, effect. Um, all this, of course, is Bediavad. That a person should make sure to take care to bake his matzot properly. I need to let everybody listening here live and those listening on a recording on the podcast. It's important to note that even according to the lenient opinions, that Choser Veneor is permitted, meaning that the Chametz does not reawaken. Okay? It is forbidden to intentionally blend Chametz into a mixture before Pesach and annul it in the 60 to 1 ratio in order to eat on Pesach. You can't purposely, before Pesach, pour a little bit of beer, okay, into your chicken in your chicken dish, even though you know you have more than 60 to 1, and, ah, but the rabbi told me before Pesach, it's nullified. To intentionally do it is asur. It's only done when it was, it's only permitted when it was done inadvertently. Um, so, according to the, the strict opinion, since the mixture may not be eaten, right, you, can, you also can't keep this item in your house. It's good to know. So Ashkenazim, if you if you hold of Choser Veneor and now this mixture now is prohibited to you, you can't even keep it in your house. Sfardim, it's, you're allowed to even to eat it on condition that the mixture happen inadvertently or unintentionally. Um, the Mishnah Brua does state though that if a little bit of chametz was mixed before Pesach and there are less than sixty parts of the permissible food um, to another chametz, you could add more food. So, for example, um, a little bit of beer fell into the um, uh, a sauce that you were making, and you know you don't have sixty times the sauce. So the Mishnah Bura says that it is permissible to add more of the sauce to nullify the beer sixty to one. However, there are others that say you're not allowed to do this because it looks like you're intentionally trying to nullify the food. In extreme situations, probably best to ask your local rabbi. Uh, but again, in extreme situations or dealing with a great loss, it's probably uh, probably allowed. The last thing I want to speak to you tonight <clears throat> is whether or not chametz that imparts a bad taste, a foul taste, renders food uh, forbidden. This is we're going to see another big difference between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. There's another well-known rule that is called noten. Ta'am lifgam. That something that imparts a foul taste, pegam, pegam means it's foul, it's putrid, it's spoiled. Something that imparts a foul taste does not render a mixture forbidden. For example, if non-kosher meat falls into a pot of kosher food and the quantity of the kosher food is 60 times that of the non-kosher food, we say that the taste of the non-kosher food is nullified. So I can have a strip of bacon, okay, into a big pot roast, huge pot roast, okay, a little tiny strip of bacon, and there's 60 times more roast than that piece of terefa, then it's nullified. This is all on condition that you can't actually taste the bacon, but that's laws of Yoridea and Kashrut, which we'll talk about another time. But assuming you can't taste the bacon, and, and it's not recognizable, all right, and, and it's all one big mix and blend or whatever it is, you can't tell where it is, then the, the, the food is kasher. On the other hand, if the kosher food is not 60 times the quantity of the non-kosher meat, it's forbidden to eat the food because the taste of the non-kosher food is discernible when it's less than 60. Now, this only applies when the taste is discernible. However, if the taste of the non-kosher food is foul, is pagum, 
is spoil. Since it spoils the cooked dish, then it doesn't render it kosher. It doesn't render it non-kosher anymore. As long as the kosher food constitutes a majority of the mixture, no longer do you need 60 times. If the non-kosher food is spoiled, then as long as you have majority kosher food, you can you can eat the whole the whole dish. Now, what about a chametz mixture on Pesach? Chametz on Pesach is prohibited. So do I look at chametz like it's pork, and therefore the same rules apply or not? So some poskim write that the fact that the sages, due to the gravity of the chametz prohibition, ordained that a drop of chametz renders any mixture forbidden, teaches us that the matter doesn't depend upon the taste but th- that it gives to the mixture. So even if it does contribute a foul taste, who cares? It's no different than a drop of chametz, which also contributes no taste. And therefore, there are some poskim, the rashbam, the rashba, that write, can't eat it. Oh, but it's a foul taste. And you can't even notice it. Not too bad. You can't eat this mixture. However, the opinion of most Rishonim is that chametz is like all the other prohibited foods, except with regards to bitul bashishim. Where other forbidden foods don't render a mixture forbidden, like in the case of noten, tam, lifgam, chametz also does not render a mixture forbidden. So, in practice, Shulchan Aruch, again, representing the Sefaradim, rules leniently, where the Ramah, who represents the Ashkenazim, follow the stringent ru- ruling that even a drop of foul-tasting chametz renders an entire mixture forbidden. While as the Sefaradim hold, no, it doesn't. It's just like all the other non-kosher foods. And as long as there's 60 times more, uh, if it's foul, then it is, it is fine. So let us clarify this by an example. You have a pot of non-kosher meat. I'm uh, sorry, a pot in which non-kosher meat is cooked absorbs the taste of non-kosher meat. All right? So if I cook pork in a pot, the pot itself absorbs the taste of the pork, of the pig. Now, if I take that non-kosher pot and I take kosher meat, a brisket, and I put it in that non-kosher pot to, co- to cook my kosher food, the kosher food is going to absorb the taste of the pork that was injected in the walls of the pot. That's why we're not allowed to use non-kosher utensils, for that reason. So therefore, it renders your brisket forbidden. However, you may have heard this law, if more than 24 hours have passed since the cooking of that pork, then the taste of the pork that entered the pot is no longer relevant, is no longer discernible. And therefore, it's called pagum, it's spoiled. So even though taste is going into your brisket, after 24 hours, that's not a good taste, that's a foul taste. It's pagum. And it won't render your brisket forbidden because the pot... We call it noten ta'am lifkam. It gives a taste that is pagum, that is spoiled. So now, for chametz, let's match. Similarly, if one by mistake cooks in a chametz pot on Pesach, food that is uh, non-chametz, okay? So you take a chametz pot. I didn't know, but I, I cooked my brisket. I cooked my lamb and this pot is chametz. According to the Shulchan Aruch, the Sfaradim, and most poskim, since more than 24 hours have passed since you last used that pot. Oh, that pot I didn't use th- th- three weeks ago. I used it cooking my Purim Seuda. It was three weeks ago, four weeks ago since I used that pot. Way more than 24 hours. So the Shuchana Ruch and the Sfaradim write, the food is kosher. You have nothing to worry about. Your brisket, your lamb in that chametz pot is kosher. However, according to the Ashkenazi custom, although the taste of chametz absorbed into the pot is foul, and it's been a month since you've used it, according to Ashkenazim, we don't care. We're strict. It still renders the food forbidden because during Pesach, 
we take the stringent position that even noten tam nifkam renders a food uh, for, forbidden. And this is the custom amongst the Sfaradim, uh, uh, amongst the Ashkenazim. And uh, here too, the Mishnah Brua writes that if a person doesn't have a custom, he can maybe act like the Sfaradim, a little bit lenient. Um, however, he commends those who act stringently. Yet again, another example where this has a big effect on we Sfaradim. Sometimes, you know, uh, I, I always quote this halacha quoted by Rav Yitzchak Yosef in the name of his father, um, <clears throat> who he writes very clear. He writes that food that was made in factories, chametz, you, chametz machinery, can be eaten by Sfaradim because of this. Because of the, because it's nullified. Especially from the fact that it is, A, it's been nullified, so it's not Choser Veneor. And we say that Stam Kelei Goyim, the, the general um, Kelim utensils of, Jew, of non-Jews, Enam Bnei Yomam, are not used constantly, and therefore they have the status of everything Pagum. So it's so important to know these differences as a Sephardic Jew that helps us celebrate the holiday a lot easier. And therefore, this is something to know. If a Sephardic Jew cooks with a Hametz pot on Pesach, the food is still kosher. The Ashkenazi has to throw out that food. However, just like before, we have to stress that according to all opinions, you're not permitted to use a utensil purposely for forbidden food. You can't purposely take your chametz pot to cook your brisket, your lamb, on Pesach. You can't do that. Uh, you can't purposely take uh, a, a dairy utensil to cook with meat. If it's done by accident, then you start to employ, well, when was the last time that it was used? Uh, the Chachamim were concerned that if a person was to do this, if they permitted the use of such utensils after 24 hours, people would make mistakes and even use them within the 24 hours. And they would end up eating forbidden food. Uh, and this is also the halakha, not just by kosher and non-kosher, not just by meat and milk, but also the halakha on Pesach. If one violated this prohibition and intentionally used a utensil that had absorbed forbidden foods, in this case, chametz, even though more than 24 hours have passed, Mos Poskim write that he is not permitted to eat that food because of a rabbinic penalty that was imposed on, that is imposed on him, and as a result, he has to throw out that food. A lot of information here, but really, really relevant uh, halachot in, to, to, to begin the prop, process of us preparing for this amazing holiday that is less than a month away. You may want to listen to this class again. It's probably worth it. You may want to even share this class with your friends, especially if they're Sefaradim, so that they are aware of the many, it's not even leniencies, I wouldn't call it a leniency. They're aware of the halachot that the Shulchan Aruch is posek, and how Svaradim have a much different take on the holiday of Pesach than our brothers the Ashkenazim. And with that, Bezrat Hashem, I hope to see you next week, live on Monday, where we tackle another subject on this, on this beautiful holiday of Chag Pesach. Wishing everybody a wonderful night ahead. Good night.